we're going to finish the 17th chapter of Wise Child by Monica Furlong, The Summoning Stone. The Summoning Stone is the stone that Maeve gave uh, Wise Child when she first ran into her behind her aunt's house. Uh, Wise Child kept the stone, never told Juniper about it, and she's seeing sparks of fire inside of it, and then it starts singing to her in Maeve's voice. First it's asking Wise Child to come to her, and then Maeve's voice is saying that she will come to Wise Child, and it is definitely having an effect. Wise Child is very entranced by the stone, so we'll see what happens. As I heard this, I had a vision of Maeve sitting forth, probably on horseback with a servant or two, perhaps the man on the black horse who had pursued me. How long would it take her to get to the White House? A day and a night, perhaps, if the tides were right and a ship was crossing? But did the words mean that she had already set off? or only that she was thinking about it, was there a hint of menace in the last line? Why never ever to Rome? I had thought that Maeve and I would travel together. I waited in agony for the next day's words, but my agony was no less when I heard them. Wise child I am on the wave, coming thence my child to save, loving heart shall bear to bear her home, Never ever thence to Rome. I, th I felt stricken as I listened to this, not joyful anymore. I knew that somehow, I did not know how, I had summoned Maeve, and that having summoned her, I did not want her to come, still less to carry me away. I did not want her to love me, or I did want her to love me, and I was tempted by the wonders of her luxurious house, the dresses and the books and bran, but I wanted to be as free as I had been with Juniper, free to learn, to travel, to marry or not marry, to become a Doran or not. Now Maeve would come and take me away, and I had to f and I had a feeling that this time she would never let me return to Juniper. Like someone who has been bitten by a snake, I leaped off from the s I leaped up from the steps, dropping the stone, and I dashed into the house. I locked the door that was never locked. I gave Daisy an enormous helping of hay and the chickens huge helpings of grain and water, and then I went and bolted the back door of the house. If Maeve had been on the sea that very morning, I calculated she would come ashore sometime that afternoon and would probably reach the house by nightfall. I sat down in Juniper's chair, and I could feel my heart thumping in terror, as if settling myself for a long vigil. I decided that I needed the bearskin, and I fetched it, wrapped it around my shoulders, and sat down again in Juniper's chair. I felt very alert, as if every part of my body and mind was looking out for signals of Maeve's approach. After a while, when nothing happened, this first terrified state abated a bit. It was still morning, and Maeve would not reach me until afternoon, unless my skin prickled. She adopted some other means of travel. If she could do that, I reflected, the locked doors would not keep her out. The morning wore on sometimes going very slowly, sometimes galloping past. I could not bear to do anything that needed concentration. The return to reality would be too painful, yet I was bored at the same time as being very frightened. Once or twice I whimpered under the bearskin. The sides of Juniper's chair held me curled up inside it. I was like I was a pea in a pod. In spite of my fear, I eventually became hungry. I had had no breakfast, and I uncurled myself and ate some bread and honey. The familiar food was comforting. This nightmare with Maeve could not happen could not be happening. The real world was the world of life with Juniper, books and herbs and stories and laughing together. Back in the chair again I dozed off. For a long time I tried to fight the sleepy feeling, but gradually it overcame me like a spell. I thought later that I had probably slept for an hour when I heard a small noise outside. At once I was fully alert. Then there was a loud knock at the door. I had no idea what to do. It could not, I could not possibly answer the knock, even as it did not appear to be Maeve herself. It might be her in disguise, like the stepmother in the fairy tale. How would I know? She would give me something, like a red apple. I would take a bite, and then I was frozen in the chair. The collar knocked again, even lo more loudly and firmly. This time I wanted to shout out, Go away! But thought... It was better to pretend I was not at home. Just as I was thinking that something really terrifying, just as I was thinking that something really terrifying happened, 
a sort of scrabbling sound under the window, and then to my horror a face appeared there, nose flattened against the glass, and I screamed and put my head under the bearskin. And that's the end of chapter 17.